Berserk was always that manga that seemed like an urban legend to me. Everyone who's talked to me about it has said the same thing. This joint is legendary, best written manga to this day. If you haven't read Berserk, then you need to rethink your life. But even after years of hearing straight positives about this manga, we still haven't read it, cause Donchi's pussy. Nah yeah, in this case that's facts. Wait, what? Among all the high praise, I was always told that Berserk is dark as hell. This isn't your average everyday darkness. This is advanced darkness. Whether you read the manga or watch the anime, this series shows some of the vilest acts committed by the vilest beings, and it does so with no chill. But you guys really wanted me to get into it, and I'm a big boy now, so I did. So today, we're here to break down Berserk and give you our honest thoughts on the manga. Conscience, you good bro? Yeah, I'm just kinda... So, so you're really not gonna argue about that pussy comment? Nah, I thought we were past that. Nah, nah, we are, I just... I kinda expected an argument. Anyways, play that intro, son. Yo, real quick. Just want to let you guys know that it's gonna get pretty graphic from here. There's a lot of crazy shit that happens at Berserk and very little is left to imagination. So if you don't feel good about looking at a whole bunch of graphic content, I click off the video right now. But if you're good, let's keep it pushing. Berserk was written and drawn by Kentaro Miura and began serialization in 1989. Miura originally released a prototype called Berserk the Prototype before Berserk's official release. It served as a preview to the screwed up world that the actual manga presents, but it's not canon. By 1990, Berserk started getting published in the mature Japanese magazine that was formerly named Animal House. It changed its name to Young Animal in 1992. And since then, Miura has continued to build in the manga, with it really gaining hype when the Golden Age arc started. This arc starts at the end of Volume 3, right after the very short Black Swordsman arc. It had an anime adaptation in 1997, along with the movie trilogy that came out in 2012. And it's actually the arc we're going to focus on in this video. We're not starting from Volume 1 this time, because that's not really giving Berserk the justice it deserves on this channel. The Black Swordsman arc was cool, but it was like a random quest in the RPG that is this manga. The Golden Age arc covers everything from the origins of this manga's protagonist, Guts, to the event that pushed him to go on the adventure that he's been on for the last 300 plus chapters. So we feel like breaking this arc down, rather than just talking about Volume 1, will give you a better overall feel for the story. Now with that primer out the way, let's move on to the fucked up world of Berserk. We begin with a band of mercenaries walking past a tree holding multiple hung dead corpses. Yeah, we're skipping zero and going straight to 100. Baby Guts was somehow birthed from one of these corpses and is just laying there in a pool of blood. A woman named Shisu spots the baby and decides to take him for herself. But the leader of this band of mercenaries, Gambino, is like, ew, you just found that baby on the floor in a pool of blood. That's a bad omen and a half. Put it back. But he lets her keep guts since she quickly takes a liking to the baby. But that bad omen part comes to fruition mad quick. At the ripe age of three, Shisu dies from the freaking plague, thus making guts an orphan for the second time. And to make matters worse, this pretty much confirms the band's suspicions of him being a bad omen. And with this story being based on the medieval times, when a few people say you're a bad omen, everyone starts treating you like shit just out of fear. But Guts gives no fucks. He didn't even cry when his mom died. For the next few years, he works in the mercenary camp. Then at the age of six, he begins training with Gambino. But his training is harsh. He's forced to use weapons that are way bigger than him. And Gambino is a cruel asshole who's not afraid to slap a child with a sword for the one time. But this man is the closest thing Gus has to a parent. So over time, he starts liking the guy. And by the age of nine, he starts entering battles with Gambino and the rest of the mercenaries. But the feelings are definitely not mutual. Cause this man, this awful, awful human being sells Gus to some sick pervert in the squad named Donovan after his first siege with the team. And yeah, I'm sure you guys know what happens next. However, Donovan obviously wasn't aware that Guts doesn't play that shit. He's much stronger than when he was six years old trying to hold a sword properly. During another battle with the mercenaries, he singles out the dude and shoves his sword in the guy's mouth demanding the name of the person who sold him out. The guy says Gambino, but Guts refuses to believe it. He kills Donovan, then returns to his team only to find out that Gambino got horribly injured. He lost a leg, so he can no longer join the band in sieges. This destroys whatever relationship Guts has with the mercenary leader. For two years, Gambino viciously, verbally, and physically abuses the kid, even when Guts returns for missions with money to give to him. That's like beating your child for doing their homework. This violent change in attitude reaches its climax when a drunk Gambino shows up in Guts' tent, ready to kill him. He starts telling the kid how he really feels. He blames him for Shisu's death and for his lost leg. 
He's the bad omen who caused all of this. They should have left him to die a long time ago. Then he confirms that he sold Guts for three silver coins so Donovan can violate him. And Guts finding out like this, that broke my heart. Look at his face, son. Like fam. You know how in the intro I was talking about the boss acts being done in this manga? This is what I was talking about. So Gambino goes for the kill, but Guts acts quickly and stabs him in the neck. Then he has a mini breakdown because even though this dude was a shit stain, he was still the closest thing he had to a father. But that breakdown is interrupted by Gambino's men coming in and realizing that this boy just killed their leader. Guts fights his way out the camp, then falls off a cliff after getting shot by a freaking arrow. This child is like 11, bro. What is this, Pokemon? With two broken ribs, the kid keeps it pushing, but he runs into a pack of wolves because his life sucks. For a moment, he accepts death. But without thinking, he fights back and kills the pack of wolves. Then he collapses from exhaustion and is found by a caravan of people. After waking from his injuries, he ends up joining a different mercenary band and continues killing for coin. Four years later, we find a now 15-year-old Guts doing his mercenary thing during a siege. The opposing army's ace, the Grey Knight Bazuso, enters the fray. And while the soldiers around him cower in fear, Guts waits for this grown-ass man to bring the smoke, like a real G. The person in charge of his army offers to pay him a hefty price for killing the general. So he goes in and starts bodying the man still swinging a sword bigger than he is. May I remind you that this boy is 15. After he kills the man, the opposing army immediately decides to take their L. And while that happens, another band of mercenaries watch from afar and immediately notice Guts' raw power. After Guts gets his pay, the captain who paid him tries to recruit him to his ranks. However, Guts has grown to become very untrusting thanks to his life before all this. So he violently declines and goes about his business. As he continues on his travels, he gets attacked by the same group of mercenaries who were intrigued by his combat skills back at the siege. They jump Guts while on horseback and it takes him beating two of their men to realize that they probably should have just left them alone. The leader of the group, a young man named Griffith, then tells a subordinate Casca to go handle the situation. She goes for Guts, but he puts the beat down on her. Obviously, this mercenary group had no idea who they were fucking with. This causes Griffith to show up. Immediately realizing that this is the boss, Guts goes for the leader, but Griffith easily defeats him. He wakes up two days later in the mercenary camp. Griffith commanded Casca to lay with him to keep his body warm, and Casca ain't happy about that at all. Eventually, Griffith summons him to go have a talk 1v1, and he lets him know that they're the legendary Band of the Falcon. Now I'm sure there are some people watching this saying, wait, isn't it the Band of the Hawk? Well, I was confused too, so I looked it up, and I found out that some outlets mistranslate it because Taka in Japanese means both Falcon and Hawk. I was gonna stick to calling it Band of the Hawks since it's the name that I'm used to, but I found out that the name is inspired by the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. And I don't wanna misinterpret what Miyor is trying to say, so I'm just gonna stick with calling them the Falcon. At a hilltop far away from the camp, Guts and Griffith stop to have their combo, while nosy ass Casca listens in from behind the tree. The Falcon leader just comes right out with it and tells Guts that he wants him. To which Guts replies, pause bro. Then Griffith comments on Guts' fight with Bazuso. If it wasn't for the knight's axe being cracked, Guts would have died. He states that it looks like he just gambles his life away when he fights. And Guts doesn't like how this dude is talking to him like he knows him. So he lifts his sword, challenging Griffith to a fight. If Griffith wins, then he will join the band of the Falcon. However, if he wins, well, I mean, nothing happens if he wins. Griffith would just be dead. The two duel, and it gets so good that the rest of the band joins Casca to watch everything unfold. Griffith ends up outplaying Guts and easily puts him in check, but Guts is like, fuck that, then bites the guy's sword and pushes him on the ground. Then he starts decking him. It looks like Guts may take the W, but Griffith turns the tables and gets him in a shoulder lock. Then he tells Guts to quit or else. Guts tells him to eat a dick. So Griffith dislocates his shoulder, and with that he joins the band of the Falcon. But Casca is jealous because she was Griffith's favorite first. Now Guts is here and he's getting all the love. Regardless of those feelings though, she still saves Guts from Falcon members who try to kill him while he's recovering, because Griffith doesn't want anyone hurting his new Pokemon. Guts acknowledges the kind gesture and lets her know that he now owes her two saves. But you know Casca, she doesn't fuck with him. She walks away telling the dude to go and get himself killed in a battle. With that, Guts continues to work with his new band. He eventually learns to trust again, and these guys grow to become friends he holds close to his heart, especially Griffith. Griffith also shows him this weird looking thing called a bailiff that he wears around his neck. This will become very important later. And during this time, he also tells Guts about his dream of building his own kingdom no matter what. And this leaves Guts thinking about what his goal may be. Time skip, we move three years later. Guts is now grown and is flexing his time skip power up. He's been promoted to captain of the Falcon Raiders. 
and he and his squad are currently aiding the Kingdom of Midland in a war that's been going on for 100 years against the Tudor Empire. Like many of his battles in the past, Guts tears through the regular ass humans who dare stand in his way. He was already a beast with the sword before, but now he's got way more muscle behind that swing. After ending this battle, Guts' comrades praise him and practically carrying them through the battle. He's become that tanky bruiser they never knew they needed. He's like Darius from Lee. However, Casca is still a hating ass hater. The three year time skip just made her more comfortable with yelling at Guts. She's mad because during the siege, Guts left his unit to push through hordes of soldiers on his own. I mean, she's right, but it worked, didn't it? Doesn't matter. She thinks that Guts hasn't changed since joining the Band of the Falcon three years ago. All he wants to do is swing his sword around. And this comment actually gets to him. But Griffith steps in before their argument gets heated. Now way more close to the guy, Gus tells his leader that he does care about his comrades. Casca's just being Casca. But Griffith has no worries about this. Over the last three years, his trust in him has grown, and it shows that Griffith has a higher respect for him compared to most of the band members. And Guts honestly deserves all the respect right now, because thanks to him eating the enemy, Griffith gets knighted, and the Band of the Falcon officially gets recruited into the Midland Army. As a group of mercenaries, this is the dream. Working for an army means they'll gain social status and a steady income along with a place to actually call home. However, this dream quickly turns into a nightmare during their next siege. For one of the first times, the Band of the Falcon is having a really hard time with the enemy. But the problem is just one soldier. This soldier is Nosferatu Zod. He's a legendary warrior that mercenaries have been telling stories about for hundreds of years. Guts is pissed because he hasn't heard from his unit after sending them in to fight Zod. Then after seeing one of them come out completely torn, Guts is like, welp, can't have that. Then he goes in alone to challenge the warrior. As he goes deeper into Zod's domain, he finds a bunch of bodies mangled and destroyed. Then he finds the monster, a hulking figure who looks nothing like a human. Guts challenges the thing, and to his surprise, he's thrown back. He admits that this is the toughest opponent he's ever faced. But Guts is not the only one who's impressed. Zod is thrilled by the fact that there's a human who could take the hands he's been trying to dish out for centuries. However, Guts is still only a human. He's one of the realest of all time, but he's still just a human. After wounding Zod, the monster gets way too excited, then morphs into his true form, a horned demon. And Guts low-key wets himself after experiencing a being like this for the first time. The monster rushes in, and Guts tries to hold it off. But the thing is just way too strong. Luckily, Griffith enters with the squad to save his ass. But Zod's like, what is this bullshit smash? I'm trying to have my 1v1. Back the hell up! Then he starts ripping through the soldiers who followed Griffith in here. The Falcon leader peeps and tells Casca to get everyone to back up. This leaves him and Guts alone to fight with Zod. Using teamwork they get far, but this is still a 300 year old demon we're talking about. He slaps both of them away, excited that he's found two humans who can catch the hands. This is the best day of his life. But when he goes to deliver the finishing blow to Griffith, he notices the Balin and calls it the Egg of the King. He backs up in complete confusion, mentioning something called a God Hand. Then he tells Gus that their battle is gonna have to wait, but he's not sure if they're even gonna see each other again. That's ominous. Yeah. Then he leaves him with a prophecy. If he is a true friend of Griffith, then he must take heed when his ambition collapses. Death will pay Guts a visit, a death that he can never escape. And with that, Zod bounces. The band starts recuperating from that experience, but Casca is more pissed than she's ever been at Guts. She looks back at the man, with tears filling her eyes, saying, if it wasn't for you, none of this would have happened, and Griffith would be okay. And that's where we'll stop for now. But to find out what happens next, this time you just gotta wait till next week. Yup, as we said, we want to do Berserk justice on this channel. So we want to cover the whole Golden Age arc. However, this arc takes up nine volumes, bruh, nine. To read all that, then summarize it in a way that makes sense would take way more than a week. So to keep the content pushing for you guys, I thought I'd do something similar to Totally Not Mark. I'll break down and review the arc as I get through it. Then in the end, I can upload a video combining all those videos so you have one place to enjoy the entire breakdown. Let me know how you feel about that in the comments below. But with that, let's move on to our thoughts. So I think Berserk is gangsta as shit, straight up. Here we have a kid who was just born in a shit situation, yet he still perseveres because he knows that no one is gonna save him. And he does so without being some kind of chosen superhuman or whatever. Guts is not special. He's got his ass beat. He's not some immortal badass protagonist. He's a vulnerable badass. And that vulnerability that the manga shows makes the moments where he gets back up, regardless of the odds, even better. Like you guys saw it. This world is fucked up. And Miura is not afraid to show how cruel the world can be to one individual. Even if that individual is just trying to grow up. And yes, it can get depressing. 
But this also pushed me to root for Guts from the very start. I just want to see something good happen to him. It's like the manga said this president of darkness, so now us as readers get hype over the smallest glimmers of light. And I like that. Those glimmers are enough to give me hope that maybe Guts will catch a break. But then the manga snatches it away almost immediately with some crazy shit. As for the other characters, they don't really get as much play as Guts in this part. But after this, Griffith and Casca specifically get way more attention. In this part though, I didn't really like Casca. As we said earlier in the video, she's a hating ass hater. Dead ass. Hating on Guts after her people tried to kill him? Guts just defended himself. What kind of shit is that? She becomes better later when her hate boner for Guts gets a little flaccid. But for now, stop being a hater, Casca. As for Griffith, it's creepy how hard it is not to like the guy. And this is coming from someone who knows what he ends up doing to screw up Guts' life. Muir did a crazy job in making this dude look like the perfect leader. It makes you wonder how the hell he got here instead of sitting in a cozy castle somewhere. But there are still moments where you notice that something ain't right about this guy. And trust me, for those who know nothing about Berserk, something is not right with this guy. But you'll see that later. As for the anime, I've never watched the original adaptation before, but I have heard good things about it. The trilogy that covers the Golden Age arc is pretty good too. The CGI is kind of hard to look at sometimes, but overall it's a good watch. But overall, I'm enjoying the manga so far. It's sad as fuck, but hard to let go of once you're in. And the art is superb, like Miura really put his foot in this. I'm not a fan of the realistic character designs though, but that's just me. We recommend it, but only if you're ready for all the graphic images you'll see. What you saw in this video was like the filtered version. Yeah, Miura plays no games. But whether you get into it or not, we'll be back next week to cover more of the Golden Age arc. What's going on, folks? Donchi from the future here. Just thanking you for watching the video so far. I'm working on more compilation videos like this, so if you like this kind of content, don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps the channel out a lot. But with that being said, I'll stop bothering you. Y'all can get back to the video. Starting from where we left off, the Band of the Falcon has just witnessed their first supernatural being. During a siege, they encountered the 300 plus year old demon Nosferatu Zod, and this monster went to town on these guys. But after taking on both Guts and Griffith, the beast noticed Griffith's bailet, then fell back. He left warning Gus to take heed when Griffith's ambitions collapse, and told him that a death he could never escape awaits him. Now we are back in Midland. The band of the Falcon are healing up from the shitstorm that was Zod, and our boy Gatsu is trying to see how his boy Griffith is doing. He finds his fellow Falcons waiting to see their leader, because now Griffith is so important, he's being guarded while he's recovering. But Guts doesn't give a fuck. That's his friend, and he's trying to see him. So in crutches, he dispatches the two soldiers guarding the place. Now he's not supposed to be doing this, so Casca punches him in the face. If you don't remember, she's still mad at Guts because Griffith got injured trying to save him. And also because Guts and Griffith have a little bro relationship going on, and she wants that White Falcon D all to herself. She looks at Guts, tears in her eyes again, saying, Why you gotta be like this? You mad rowdy. And Griffith still likes you more. But Guts can do without the lecture from Casca. So he dips, while the rest of the Falcon comment on how it seems like Griffith is shifting away from them. You see that? You see that right there? Foreshadowing. The next time we find Guts, he's working on his sword swings. Then his bro friend Griffith shows up. It's low-key wild how these guys are recovering from the same battle, yet Guts is out here training while Griffith is still in crutches. The two talk about the whole Zod incident, and Guts mentions how the Bailet saved their lives. Griffith seems inspired by the fact that there are things in this world like Zod that just exist. However, Guts is kind of like, I don't know, bro. I was cool with dealing with, like, regular humans. This demon shit is kind of wild. But what's really on Guts' mind is why Griffith saved them back then. As the leader of the Falcons, it's careless to put his life on the line for one soldier, so why? And Griffith asks him why he needs a reason to put his life on the line for his sake. Okay, so when I first watched this movie, I was like, oh, that's nice. Griffith's low-key calling him his friend. But this man Griffith throws the most mixed signals. You'll see later in the video. Before the bro friends are able to talk more about their complicated relationship, they're greeted by the King of Midland, along with his uptight younger brother, Count Julius. Julius has a huge hate boner for Griffith and the Band of the Falcon, because they're regular commoners who get the privilege of chilling with stuck-up nobles like him. However, the King actually respects Griffith, and believes that people like him would become the cornerstone of this kingdom. Nobles will win this war, the hands will. While they're talking, the King's daughter Charlotte shows up. Because she's an anime damsel, she trips in front of the men only for Griffith to catch her. They share a moment, but Julius ruins it by slapping the taste out of Griffith's mouth. You dare touch a noble as a commoner? Are you on meth? Gus prepares to body this fool, but Griffith holds him back like, nah bro, it's fine. He's right. I was wrong. And he looks at Julius with this death stare that makes you know he's gonna die. 
Now we move to the traditional Midland hunt. This is an event where they all watch them do tons of animals. Not sure why this is so fun, but hey, guess this is the only entertainment they have in this universe. The hating ass bitch Julius is currently plotting to kill Griffith, who's attending the hunt with his fellow Falcons. And one thing that I love about the manga is that there's this whole scene where Julius kind of gets influenced to kill Griffith out of fear that he'll eventually have to look up to him as an equal. This weird bald dude comes up to him like, hey bro, that dude Griffith, I don't know. He kind of smooth. If you're not careful, he's gonna take your job, bro. This wasn't in the movie, so I never really knew what went behind this plan. However, I'm assuming this was in the original anime. If it wasn't, let me know in the comments. Anyways, the hunt continues. And while that's going on, Griffith low-key puts the moves on Charlotte. My man heard what Julius said and was like, fuck it, I can still smash. Casca peeps the shenanigans from afar and she gets salty, but everyone gets interrupted when a boar runs through out of nowhere and Charlotte's horse loses its mind. Griffith chases after the princess and saves her before the horse throws her into the water. Now Charlotte is really feeling the Falcon leader, crying and hugging him and shit. Then as he assists the girl, Griffith gets shot by one of Julius's men. Guts runs to his boy with the squad ready to murder someone. He looks for the assailant, but the guy is hiding. Pussy! Luckily though, the arrow didn't do shit. Griffith's small ass bailet took the hit. And good for him too because his arrow had poison on the tip. But Griffith ain't no fool. He knows this wasn't some accident. He peeps that Julius is the one behind this. And Julius low-key knows that Griffith knows he's behind this, so Julius is kind of shook. And he should be. After the hunt, Griffith calls Gus to a library within the castle and tells him to kill the Count. I don't know about you guys, but I wouldn't want to get killed by Guts. So Gatsu sneaks into the castle. He watches the Count berate his son for being weak, and it reminds him of his times with the Gambino back in the day, before the guy kind of lost his mind. Then once Guts catches Julius slipping by himself, he rushes in and kills a dude in one swoop. And just like that, Guts is a criminal. Then Guts hears someone about to enter the room, so he rushes in and kills the person. But our boy should have checked first, son. When he looks up, he realizes that he just killed the Count's innocent son. And just like that, Guts reaches a new level of depression. But he doesn't have time to be sad about this awful mistake. Gars just saw what he did, so now he has to fight his way through the place to escape. He finds a sewer and climbs in their TMNT style before anyone sees his face. Then he makes it back to his fellow Falcons, battered and probably smelling like shit. Casa comes in, questioning Guts for living as usual, but Guts just wants to know where Griffith is. And everyone in the band peeps that something is way off with Guts. Once Casca tells him, he dips, and all the other members of the band are left wondering what the hell is going on. Guts finds Griffith putting the moves on Princess Charlotte, and before he goes to cockblock without knowing, Casca stops him and wraps his wound, telling him to wait till Griffith's done. Imagine if Guts really went over there, bloody after killing the second in line to the throne. Like, Guts, think. Charlotte would have lost her mind. But I mean, he did just accidentally kill a kid, so I'm pretty sure his mind is not completely there right now. So Charlotte and Griffith are having a convo about war. The princess is not a fan, but Griffith eloquently states that war is just a tool for men to achieve their dreams, and that all men should make it their life's mission to follow their dream. Then Charlotte comments on how impressed she is by the Falcon leader. He's a warrior, refined like a noble, playful like a child, but now he sounds like a philosopher. I feel like Charlotte is us as the reader. Like she's so enthralled by Griffith, but she has no idea how secretly fucked up this dude is. The princess tells the leader that his friends must be attracted by his charm, but Griffith changes the mood completely by saying that his comrades are not his friends. Someone who rather follows someone else's dream instead of following their own is not worthy of being called his friend. And don't forget Guts is hearing all of this. Griffith basically just said they're not friends. So this whole time, while Guts thought he was building a friendship, he was just being used. Griffith basically told Charlotte, Guts is my side bro, don't worry about him. Then maids from the castle show up and tell him about the death of Julius and his son. And Griffith smiles maniacally after hearing the news. Like if you were still on the fence about Griffith being a little off, this should tip you off. And with that, Guts walks off, confused, depressed, and frustrated. We move to another war. Griffith is making his way to his band until he's stopped by the same guy who influenced Julius to try and get him with that stray arrow. The guy tries to bait Griffith into making it obvious that he killed the Count, but he keeps his composure and walks off. But before he leaves, he gives the dude the death stare, the same one he gave Julius. So now this dude is shook. He's probably gonna die soon. The princess stops Griffith, begging him to stay safe. She even begs Casca to protect him with her life. So she's definitely feeling Griffith way more now. And I know Casca got salty after Charlotte said what she said. She's been fighting alongside Griffith for the longest. And now this princess, who gets to live a life she never had the luxury of living, is out here stealing her man just cause she's pretty. Damn. You saying that really made me feel for Casca in this situation. Yeah, this part sucks for Casca. In fact, she's about to take a lot of bells in this upcoming part of the story. We move to the actual war. The band of the Falcon are up against the <clears throat> Blue Whale Ultra Heavy Armored Fierce Assault Annihilation Night Corp. Bro, what is up with these names? Yo, for real. Julius has the White Dragon Knights. There were the Black Ram Iron Lance Knights from before. These names sound overdramatic as fuck. 
Now, I'm not sure if this is a manga thing or if the armies in the medieval times actually did name themselves like this. If one of you guys know, let me know in the comments. I like when you guys give me interesting facts that I never knew about. Anyways, as the war rages on, Casca gets cornered by the captain of the opposing army, Adon. Under regular circumstances, Casca would have probably smoked this fool, especially after he pretty much called her Griffith's hoe. But Casca is feeling faint because she's going through her period. Random ass side characters who just look like they're gonna die try to help. And of course, Adon kills them. But then, Guts comes in to defend Casca. He's obviously still feeling sour about what Griffith said, so now he's just trying to cut something with his big ass sword. He tells Casca to get her act together because normally she wouldn't be this weak. Then he takes Adon out in just two swings, calling his special move trash. But when he goes to Casca, her lack of energy makes her tip off the cliff they're on. Gus tries to grab her, but a still conscious Adon shoots him with a crossbow, causing them both to fall off the cliff and into a river. Moments later, he emerges from the river with Casca, and they take shelter in a cave. While trying to take care of her, he knows notices that she was fighting through the battle while on her period, thus showing him how hard it is for a woman on the battlefield. I like this part because this is one of the first times we see someone show empathy for Casca as a woman warrior. And the fact that it's Guts who shares this moment with her makes it all the better. She wakes up the next day pissed that Gus took her clothes off in order to stop her from getting any more sick. And Guts is about sick of her wilding on him for no reason. They get into one of their regular arguments, which ends with Casca saying that she wasn't born a woman because she wanted to be. And Guts genuinely tries to apologize to her, but she tries to hit him again. She eventually chills with the violence after basically telling him that she hates him for the 75th time. So Guts awkwardly tries to change the subject by asking her how she joined the Band of the Falcon in the first place. Nice call, Guts. After pausing, she tells Gus that it's because of Griffith, which brings us into honest history of Casca. She comes from a very, very poor village. A place where going days without food is normal. When she was a child, a random noble came to her crib saying he wants to hire her as a maid in his castle. But like most of the nobles in this dark ass manga, this guy was a scum of the earth. So he attacked Casca on the way to the castle. But Griffith showed up just in time. And Casca describes the feeling as God taking pity on her and sending her an angel. He didn't just save her though. He threw her a sword and told her that if she has something to protect, she needs to pick up that sword. So Casca did just that and killed the man. Then she asked to follow Griffith and join the Band of the Falcon. For years, she watched Griffith lead them to W after W, but there was this one occasion where she saw a different side of Griffith. The Band of the Falcon was working with the feudal lord, who they heard touched little boys, and this really shook Casca up, for obvious reasons. While working for this lord, they lost a very young member of their band, and even though this kid was completely random, Griffith showed her more than the fact that this child died for his dream. Ever since that moment, Casca never looked at Griffith the same way, but this next moment is what really shook her. Our girl was traveling through the kingdom, right? Having a normal last night. Then she saw Griffith up in a room in the castle. Griffith is the bro, so she called him. But before she could finish, she saw the feudal lord come up behind him, obviously insinuating that Griffith and the old man were, yeah. And Guts' reaction to hearing this is hilarious. When Casca saw him showering the morning after, she assumed that she just misinterpreted what she saw. But Griffith was like, what you think happened is exactly what happened. He told her that it was for the money. Yes, they could keep winning wars and making money, but that's not enough. They need more war funds to grow the Falcons. And if they just rely on battles, then they'll lose more troops like the kid they found. So basically, Griffith told her that he did it for the squad. But this isn't something that Griffith just did without feeling any remorse. While talking to Casca about what happened, he started violently scratching himself telling her that he'll do anything to win. He must win. For all the people who died for his dreams, he must win. We come back to the present, and Casca finishes the story by telling Gus that Griffith has an incredible burden to bear. And that's what makes him so incredible. She wants to stay by his side, to take on some of that burden, and help him accomplish his dreams. And just when you think the two are about to have a tender moment, Casca goes back to her hate boner, pretty much yelling at Gus for existing again. She thinks he's selfish, and she can't forgive him for putting Griffith in danger. And she's also mad because Griffith likes him more than her. Y'all know the deal. And you know what's funny about all this? While Casca holds all this hate for Guts, Guts honestly just wants the best for his friends. That's it. At this point of the story, he still cares about Casca's safety, even though she yells at him like every single day. Guts is a real one, fam, for real. Like, everybody needs a Guts in their friend group, as long as you don't have a Griffith. As Casca cries in front of Guts, he peeps enemy soldiers in the area. They're still looking for these guys, and Captain Adon doesn't care if they're brought in dead or alive. So by sunset, they move out, but Casca is still feeling weak, and before they know it, they get ambushed by Adon's soldiers. Now it's them versus an army of men. These guys jump the Falcon members, and they both go to work. Casca and Guts working together, and fam, these panels are badass. Like, I thoroughly enjoyed reading this fight more than I did watching it in the movie. Miura's action scenes are so clean, and after that bit of development with Casca and Guts, I feel like this 2v many fight is the perfect icing on the cake. 
While the two are fighting, Casca realizes how much effort Gus is putting in just to protect her. And Gus tells her that he's gonna buy her some time. Right now, she's just in the way. If she leaves, then he can go all out. But Casca refuses again. Then thanks to her, Gus gets bombarded with arrows as he protects her again. You see, Casca? All the hate for Gus and he's still out here defending you. Yet you say this man is selfish. She asks Gus why he's doing the most to save her. And he tells her that as Griffith's sword, she needs to return to him. There is no reason for her to die in a fucked up place like this. Finally understanding that it's better for her to just dip, she leads telling Gus not to die. Then with no one holding him back, Guts tears through everyone. And I mean everyone. He's not just cutting people either. His blade is a little dull right now, so he's just bashing people with it. While Guts has his fun, Casca gets ambushed by more enemy soldiers. Before they're able to do anything, the squad appears. Casca tells them that Gus is in trouble, so they rush over to where he is. But when they get there, all they see are dead bodies. And it's a lot of dead bodies, like almost 100. Casca continues to look, then finally finds a wounded Gus resting on a tree. This man single-handedly took on 100 men after getting shot by an arrow, getting thrown off a cliff, barely getting any rest, and almost getting killed by Casca on multiple occasions. To say this man Guts is the goat would be an understatement. But that is where we'll stop for this week. So this part of the manga made me realize why the movies are not a good rendition of the Golden Age arc. And that's not to say that the Golden Age arc trilogy is bad, but the manga is just 50 times better. Miura makes the world of Berserk feel real. The characters feel like real people. It is very easy to get deeply immersed in this world because Miura is just that good of a storyteller. But this also kind of scares me because I know that when bodies start dropping, it's gonna hit me way harder now because I'm way more emotionally attached to these characters. The movie made me think that Guts is just some angry brute, but bruh, he is way more human here. And I think human Guts has more character depth than I'm just gonna be angry and swing my sword Guts. And y'all saw that Casca backstory. We told you she was gonna get some more love later on. And I personally did not know Casca's full backstory. So learning all of this did make me appreciate the character more. In fact, everything from the war onward really made me feel for her. This girl was battling through her period on top of that, she had to face mad sick assholes who continue to harass her just because she's a woman. She's been through a lot, but she still moves forward. And that idea of never giving up is the type of shit I live for. It's low-key anime motivation. So right now, I really fucks with Casca. Yeah, same. And her hate border for Guts is pretty flaccid thanks to their time together. So that's nice. As for Griffith, yeah, that man ain't right. You guys saw with this Miles and the death stairs. This man will let his ambitions drive him to do crazy ass things. And that's not good. And the fact that Midland nobles are low-key against Griffith is not good for him or them. But we'll see what happens next week as we continue with the Golden Age arc. So Guts has just come back from his 1v100 battle. The band is hyped that both he and Big Sis are alive, but Griffith's not here yet, so Casca is kind of sad. Girl wants to see her boo. The doctor who's patching Guts up is like, bro, this is it. Your injuries are too much. You can't continue with the campaign. But Guts is like, shut up, bitch. I'm fine till the end. That night, Guts chills outside alone thinking. Casca comes up to him with elf dust from judo, is able to accelerate the healing of wounds. He told Casca that he received this from an old friend in a traveling entertainment troupe, and I believe he was hinting at Puck here. If you don't know Puck, he's an elf who follows Gus in his adventures after Griffith screws up his life, but we'll get to that. Anyways, Casca is giving Gus his special healing dust, then all of a sudden Gus gets serious. He tells her that compared to what her and Griffith are doing, what he's doing is nothing. He's just swinging his sword around killing fools. He doesn't really have a dream of his own. Then in a really wholesome moment, Gus starts telling Casca about the dreams of everyone else in the band. Gaston, his second in command, is apparently skilled at making clothes and wants to open his own clothing shop. There's another one who proposed to a woman and is trying to get married after this war is over and others with different aspirations. And this part is beautiful because you don't only see Guts' appreciation for his squad, but this also reminds you that members of the Falcons are their own people. They're supporting characters, yeah, but they matter too. Guts says that the dreams of his comrades are like little embers, but they're being absorbed by the inferno of Griffith's ambition. Then to Casca's confusion, Guts says that his flame isn't here. She questions if this means he plans on leaving the Falcons, but he tells her that he already promised to fight till the end of the war. After that though, I guess they'll see. Before they're able to get into it more, members of the Falcon disturb them to tell them that Griffith has returned. They reunite with their leader and everything seems all right for a sec. But Casca is still worried about what Guts was talking about. We move back to the war between Midland and Tudor. Midland is stressed because Tudor just took their impenetrable Doldry Fortress. And get this, the army who raided the place is named the Holy Purple Rhino Knights. Funny thing, after looking at your comments and doing some research myself, I found out that giving armies wild names like this was actually a thing. Wait, really? Yeah, the practice has been carried on for centuries. Like there were a group of American pilots from World War II who called themselves the Flying Tigers. Huh. 
the more you know. So the military leaders of Midland are currently trying to form a plan to take out the Purple Rhinos. While pretty much everyone bitches out, Griffith nonchalantly says, I mean, if the king wants me to, I can take the Falcons and we can get your fortress back. Now, everyone is baffled by this, but what do they have to lose? Griffith is offering to save their fortress and take out their arch enemy's strongest army with just the help of his people. Midland would lose nothing but the Falcons, and most of the nobles never liked them to begin with. But as you guys know, the king of Midland fucks with Griffith. So he looks at the dude like, you did ask my guy? And Griffith is like, my king, did I stutter? So the king recognizes Griffith's gangster and allows him to take his Falcons and get the job done. Mind you, the Purple Rhinos have over 30,000 soldiers. The Band of the Falcon has around 3,000 soldiers. These guys are heavily outnumbered. But the Band isn't worried at all. They trust Griffith and know that he's not gonna put them in a situation where they would lose. But Koska is feeling a little uneasy about how Griffith may act once he gets in the battlefield. Guts peeps and is like, Koska, you good? Deji tells him some shit. So you guys remember that old man Koska mentioned in her backstory that Griffith had sex with for money? Apparently, that guy rose into power and is now the supreme leader of the Tudor Empire's northern battlefront. Meaning he is commanding the army that sieged Doldry. And he's still out here being the scum of the earth. But to make matters worse, he knows that Griffith is leading the charge against him. So tell me how this man calls in the leader of the Purple Rhino Knights, Boscon, and tells him to bring in Griffith alive. And based on how this fuck be acting, I'm sure y'all know why he wants the guy alive. So after Guts hears this, he gets kind of shook. Then we move to the start of what could be the end of this 100 year war. The Band of the Falcon are preparing to engage the Purple Rhino Knights, but they're not only outnumbered, they literally have nowhere to run. Yeah, Griffith set up this risky ass plan that's basically do or die. Busco on peeps and is like, is this man Griffith on meth? As Guts gets ready to clash blades, he thinks about how this may be his last fight with the Falcons. But he doesn't have time to think about that right now. He switches gears, gets focused, and rushes in once Griffith calls for the charge. As usual, the enemy is baffled by Guts' raw strength. Then Bus Gold gets himself involved with the warrior. Meanwhile, Governor Scumass watches over the war, but the dude is feeling uneasy because Buscon is kind of wildin' right now. He's afraid the guy might screw up and kill Griffith, so he gets his armor and decides to head to the battlefield himself to personally command the army. This man is really out here trying to get Griffith's cheeks. Yeah, this dude is pressed, bro. So back on the battlefield, Griffith initiates his plan and the Falcons retreat. Boscon, being a man of war, notices that this move is mad sus, so he stays back. But then the gross ass commander rolls up on the battlefield and is like, Boscon, you just gonna let that beautiful man run away like that? Purple Rhino Knight, I am now commanding this army. Y'all better take your asses, chase after them Falcons, and bring back Griffith alive. Whoever brings me that man will get a big ass bonus. So inspired by a possible raise, the army pushes forward, even though Buscone thinks his plan is stupid. Back to the Falcons, they retreat to the river. Then with it behind them, Griffith rallies his comrades, telling them that they must lay down their lives and fight for their survival. My man is sounding a lot like Erwin right now. But over at the Doldry Fortress, something else is going on. Koska is leading a small unit of Falcons into the place to take it over from the inside. But she has one problem. Y'all remember Adon? That bastard didn't die yet. He's chilling at the Doji Fortress too. And when he sees Koska, he gets tight. He confronts her with his army. Then they face off within the fortress. Meanwhile, on the battlefield, shit is popping off. The Holy Purple Rhino Knights are getting bodied and Governor Shitstain is tight because they still haven't gotten Griffith. Apparently, there's a soldier blocking all their attempts. And that soldier is Guts. My man is out here fighting for his friends like, I won't let you touch his booty. So Buck Bowen appears to clash the wars with the man again. They get into this intense duel, but our boy can't keep up. He says that he feels close to dead, even worse than how he felt when facing those 100 men. Man, he low-key just called all those guys trash. Meanwhile, back at the fortress, we find Adon begging for mercy. Koska is feeling much better now, so she bodied this dude. But he catches her off guard and shoots her with a paralyzing arrow. Damn, Koska, you gotta pay attention, girl. Back on the battlefield, we find Gus defeated, looking up at Boss Gone. His sword has been cut in half due to it already being damaged from the 100 men fight, and he has no horse. Guts is like, fuck, I'm screwed. I'ma fight this man with a pocket knife. Back at the fortress, Koska is fighting for her life against Adon. He corners her, but then she pulls the ultimate full counter and finally kills the guy. Now they can take the fortress, but things are still looking pretty grim on the battlefield. Guts is still stuck, and Buscon is trying to go in for the kill. Some Falcon side characters try to defend their boy, but the Purple Rhino General tears through them. Then out of nowhere, a mysterious figure chucks a big ass sword near Guts. Griffith is like, Guts, take the sword! Then with the quickness, he grabs it and beheads Buscon with one clean slice. Now the Purple Knights are shaking in their boots, because how are they going to continue fighting without their true leader? But the governor is like, Fuck Boscon, I told ya, I'm your leader now. We still outnumber them, so get that man Griffith. 
but when they look behind them, they see Casca and her unit roaring triumphantly, with the Falcon flag waving in victory. The Purple Rhinos are astonished by this turn in events, but Gut snaps them back to reality like, Don't you dumbasses get it? You lost! You're trash! Then Griffith commands his army to clean up the rest of the stragglers, and his men go to town. Governor Dickhead falls off his horse, then gets found by Griffith. The governor begs for his life, reminding Griffith about the time they spent together. But Griffith's like, first of all, you're gross as shit. Second of all, I slept with you for money. I don't know why you thought I had some weird interest in you or some shit. You were a stepping stone for my goal. That's it. Then he kills the guy. All according to Captain Irwin's plan. Backs. During the aftermath of the battle, Guts finds Casca and checks up on her. They share a nice moment thinking about how much effort it took to get here. Then he takes her to see Griffith. Then from far, far away, it's revealed the person who threw the sword that saved Guts' life was Nosferatu Zod. He says to himself that the eclipse will soon come, and the demon advent approaches. Then he disappears into the fog of war. Ooh, sounds like we're getting closer to the Griffith nonsense. So with the battle for Dodri over, we move back to Midland, only to find a bunch of hating ass nobles plotting some shit. The nobles agree that Griffith has made it far in Midland, but they don't like the idea of this peasant continuing to gain relevance within the kingdom. Since he defeated the Purple Rhino Knights, the king plans on making Griffith a general, and officially giving the Falcons the white title. This would put them on the same level as the most renowned armies in the kingdom. These nobles really don't want that though, so they plan to poison Griffith during their victory party. But Griffith just saved Midland. How are they gonna get away with killing the hero of the century? Easy, they have the queen of Midland on their side. Now you're probably wondering, how does the king fuck with Griffith when the queen doesn't? Well, it's because the queen doesn't fuck with the king. She calls him a good ruler, but a terrible husband. He never showed her the same type of love. He showed his first late wife. So she cheated on him with Julius. But my girl thought that it was just lust. She didn't actually care for the guy. She just wanted some dick. Or that's what she thought. After Griffith killed Julius, she realized she actually loved the man. And she's like 98% sure Griffith killed him. So now she is using this whole plan to avenge her dead lover. The day of the banquet soon arrives, and the nobles are gearing up to carry out their plan. But something they didn't expect happens. That same sleazy bastard who convinced Julius to try and kill Griffith gets a letter from a soldier. And this letter shakes the guy to his core. His fellow nobles ask if he's good, but he plays it off and dips. This brings us to the victory banquet. The band of the Falcon rolls up to the party looking fresh, and everyone is hyped to see them. Nobles rush in asking all these questions about the war. And while some of the Falcons enjoy the attention, Guts does it. He leaves to get away from all the noise. But then Casca comes and drags him back to the party. And Guts is like, damn girl, you looking dumb nice. They leave to go chat it up for a sec. And Guts asks why she's not trying to dance with Griffith. She looks way better than all those random noble girls fiending for his attention. But Casca's nervous. She hasn't danced in years and she's not trying to embarrass herself. Then she asks Guts what he's doing in a place like this. She didn't take him for one who likes parties. And Guts tells her that he wants to see everything for himself. He joined the Falcons three years ago, and now it finally feels like they've reached their goal. But before they're able to talk more, the king appears to give a speech. He congratulates the Falcons for their victory. Then he promotes them all to noble status, dubbing them the new White Phoenix Knights. And Griffith, as their leader, is named the White Phoenix General. Damn, that's a dope ass title. And after the speech, Griffith looks back at Guts, only to find his old friend smiling at him. And Griffith responds with a wholesome smile of his own that honestly made me feel happy for him. Once again, Mior does a good job of making the reader feel good for Griffith. Like this part actually made me feel really happy. But once again, and I know I sound like a broken record when I say this, don't get the shit twisted. This man is a fuck. He has his moments, but he's still a fuck. So with that big announcement out the way, it's time for the toast. Meaning it's time for the hating ass nobles to carry out their kill Griffith plan. The Falcon leader is given a cup, and just like they planned, he drinks into the cup and collapses due to the poison. Everyone starts freaking out, but Guts takes the moment to disappear from the scene. Outside of the castle, he spots the man responsible for giving Griffith the poison. Meanwhile, the nobles are celebrating a successful assassination in an undisclosed area. But after Baldi leaves the building, the whole place lights on fire. The nobles run to the roof to try and escape the flames. Then once the queen gets there, she spots none other than Griffith, looking up at her from outside the castle. My man knew they were plotting to kill him this whole time, so he faked his death at the party. While they thought they were plotting against Griffith, they were actually playing right into his hands. After he explains how he outsmarted all these fools, he leaves as the fire consumes the queen along with their fellow conspirators. Then he finds a bald one cowering in some corner. Apparently Griffith kidnapped this man's daughter to force him to betray his friends. That's why he got shook when he read that note. Afterwards, Griffith reconvenes with Guts, who just killed the people responsible for kidnapping the bald one's daughter. Can't have any loose ends. Then Guts and Griffith return to the squad, after once again showing these nobles why they should never mess with the Falcons. And this is where we'll stop for now. So Conscience, thoughts? 
You know, it's crazy. I feel like as we continue reading the manga, we find more reasons not to watch the Berserk trilogy. Yo, facts. A lot of what we went over today was just not in the movies. Zod never tossed Gus's sword back at the siege, and the plot to kill Griffith never happened. It said they put the time into poopsie jiceys that nobody asked for, like this. But as for this part of the manga, once again, not disappointed. For one, the battle for Doji was fucking dope. The way it was set up with that war meeting was tense. The war itself was lit. Once again, blessed me yours exceptional action scene. And the way it all ended, bro, they had me in the room going, War for victory, Falcons! Fuck you, Tudor! Yeah, that war was nothing but hype. I love how Guts and Casca came in ready after the shit they went through in the last part. I also very much like how close Casca and Guts became both inside and outside of battle. In part two, you can tell that Casca's hate boner was disappearing, but here it's like it's fully gone, and every moment they share is heartwarming. Part woman like when the Falcons all got knighted. But this is probably the last happy ending we're gonna get in this miniseries. The Falcons have reached their goal, their nobles. Now all that's left is to violently tear them down from their high. Yeah, the next few parts are gonna be pretty wild. And it all starts with Gus making good in his promise to leave the Falcons. But we'll get to that next time, whenever Doji decides to stop being lazy and make part four. Alright, so last time, we watched as the White Falcon single-handedly took down the Purple Rhino Knights, thus winning the 100-year war for Midland. So obviously the king decided to get these guys a promotion because they're out here doing the damn thing. But a bunch of nobles, including the queen, didn't like the fact that this boy Griffith was out here trying to be somebody. So they carried out a plan to kill the man, but it fails, and they all die because of it. Except for that weird bald dude who I'm surprised Griffith hasn't killed yet. Yeah, this is the second time he let this man live, but I mean, if he's trying to run this kingdom, he can't be out here killing everyone. True, true. But after all that noble murdering, Griffith and his boy Guts return to the Band of the Falcon, and everyone is hyped to see Griffith because they thought he was dead. Especially Casca. You know she loves the dude. After this, the band enjoys a few days of peace. Midland holds the queen's funeral, and luckily for Griffith, everything regarding her murder just gets swept under the rug as some kind of last attack from Tudor. But if you guys don't remember, Guts has been feeling conflicted about staying with the band. What Griffith said about only being friends with a person who has his own dreams really stuck with him. So he's been planning to leave the Falcons once the 100 year war ends. Well, the war is over. So with nothing holding him back, Guts packs his things and heads out. But Casca sees him and rushes outside before he gets too far. If it isn't obvious, Casca is starting to feel for our boy. So she tries to convince him to stay, but Guts is like, Casca, we spoke about this. I got to go. But I hope everything works out with you and Griffith. But before he dips, Judo and Corcus show up like, hold up, bro. Let's go talk about this. They head to a bar. Then Judo starts asking Guts what's up. Why are you trying to leave, bro? Tired of carrying us? But on the contrary, Guts tells him that he likes it here with the Falcons. And these have honestly been the best years of his life. But before he gets a chance to continue, Corcus butts in being salty as ever. If you didn't already know, Corcus has been on the fuck Guts train ever since our boy joined the Falcons. My man just exists. And Corcus be like, I took that personally. So Corcus is our boy have it. He starts yelling at him saying, bro, I don't even know why we're wasting our time with you here. We finally got the good life. We're nobles. We get to chill with noble women. You know how hard it is for commoners like us to get that shit? And now you're out here saying you want to throw it all away. My mans, are you dumb? Then Guts basically tells him that he wants to do more than just swing his sword around and kill. He goes into this emotional monologue about how since he was a kid, he was raised to be a weapon, but he wants to be more than that now. Seeing Griffith risk everything for his dreams inspired him, but he's sick of looking up to the guy. Guts wants to stand beside Griffith with his own dream, something that he can say he accomplished. And I vibe with that heavy, fam. I get it, Guts. You see your boy Griffith out here achieving the impossible thanks to his ambitions, and you want to attain that feeling of accomplishing something great. He wants to achieve a goal that he set out for himself, not someone else. I feel like it's the same reason why a lot of us go out looking for our passion. You see someone famous doing big things and you also want to do big things, but in your own way. Like, yeah, helping someone achieve their dreams is always great, and I feel like we should all do our part to help our friends achieve their dreams, but nothing feels greater than finding your passion and working towards a goal involving that passion. I definitely say that's one of my motivations for being a content creator. Hey, don't you? Nobody cares. Anyways, after Corcus hears what Guts has to say, he starts yelling again. I feel like he forgot that Guts can break him with one hand. He tells our boy that Griffith is only able to go for his dreams because he's special. Regular people like them don't have that luxury. They just gotta work hard and make do with what they got. Then Guts looks at him like, sounds like someone's salty because they couldn't achieve their dream. Stunned by the comment, Corcus gets tight because he knows Guts is right. Then he dips. After that, Judo tells Gus that he supports him in his choice, and that he hopes that he finds his something. Then he begins walking him out the kingdom. While the two go for what might be their last stroll together, Judo randomly brings up Casca. Just like us, he's been peeping the little hints, so he tells Gus to why not try his luck with her. And Gus is like, bro, you know she loves her some Griffith. She doesn't want my ass. Then Judo's like, nah, bro, Griffith and Casca will never happen. Yeah, Casca may want the man bad, but Griffith is trying to run this kingdom. Therefore, he's going for Princess Charlotte. Then he turns back to Guts like, so knowing all that, I gotta ask again, why not try your luck with Casca? 
don't you want to hold her? And Guts gets all nervous like, damn, I don't know, bro. I mean, is she bad? Yes. Is she a real one? Absolutely. But she's got her eyes on Griffith, bro. As I am now, I am no good for her. God damn, Miora. Why are you so good? This shit, this shit right here hit me all in my emotions, son. My man knows he likes her. I know you guys can tell, but still he's like, nah, I gotta focus on myself and better myself. The maturity, the growth, the development. Guts is out here teaching lessons, fam. Focus on being a better you before you go out and try to find love in someone else. So after that, Guts and Judah run into the rest of the band, including Griffith. Corka starts talking his shit again, then leaves Guts telling him, if I ever catch you in the battlefield, you better watch your back. But if you don't sit down before Guts kills you. Unfazed by Corcus's sodium-fueled hate, Guts leaves and almost breaks when he passes by Casca. You can see it in his face. But then Griffith stops him with his cold, lifeless stare. It's the kind of stare that lets you know you fucked up. He scolds his old friend saying, you belong to me, Guts. Who gave you the right to leave the squad? Anyone else can leave, but you? Nah, you here for life. Then he challenges Guts to a duel. If our boy wins, then he gets to take his freedom back. Guts looks at him like, damn bro, I was looking for a hug or some shit. But if you want the hands, then I shall give you the hands. Casca tries to stop them, but the band holds her back. This is something that only Guts and Griffith can settle. They lunge forward simultaneously. Then the band watches in shock as Guts defeats Griffith in one clean swoop. Devastated, the Falcon leader collapses as Guts walks past him. Then he wishes his old friends farewell and leaves. That night, Guts camps out alone in the woods for the first time in a long time. He comments on how it's been a grip since he's been on his own. And this is just something that he's going to have to learn to deal with again. While he meditates near the campfire, he starts having doubts. What if this was all a mistake? What if he's just throwing a good thing away? But he knows that this uncertainty will only drag him down. He needs to push forward, even if he has no idea where he's going to end up. And this is once again, hella relatable. Once you take that leap to follow your dreams, those inhibitions and doubts start kicking in and you start thinking, damn, did I make a mistake? Trust me, I know. I felt the same way when I dropped out of college. Like the doubts are still there. They're still lingering in my mind rent free. But if you don't believe in yourself and push forward, then those doubts will stagnate you. Anyways, while Guts thinks about this, he feels an ominous presence similar to Zod. Our boy swings his sword around, but finds no one. Then from the shadows of the forest, the mysterious Skull Knight appears. He confronts Guts saying, ah, I see the wheels of fate are turning. Guts, in a year's time, your life will be fucked, but it's okay. You literally plopped from a corpse, which means you were born in the struggle, raised by the struggle. So you must continue to fight back and struggle or else. Then he leaves. So you're just gonna stop by and drop cryptic messages? That doesn't help, bro. But after that confrontation, we move back to Midland. Princess Charlotte is feeling hella depressed in her castle because there's been a lot of death around her and she can't deal. Her maids leave her for the night, but once she's alone, guess who shows up? This wild bull Griffith. The dude is hanging from a tree outside and Charlotte has been fiending for this man. So she lets him in her room. Almost immediately, she starts crying about how much she missed him, asking him why he didn't visit her sooner. I mean, he was in a war, Charlotte, and he did almost get murdered. So your boy has been pretty busy. But the funny part about this is that Griffith keeps his lifeless stare throughout the whole thing. The kind of face that screams, bruh, I could have been at home in my bed beating my meat right now. Now this girl is crying on my chest and shit, like I care about her problems. Then out of nowhere, he starts making out with the princess and he's going in like he's not trying to end night with a kiss and all that touching leaves and them having sex. Griffith, what are you doing? And from what it looks like, he's not really having sex for lustful desires. He's mad that Gus not only left him, but was able to leave him so easily. That was probably the first time someone tossed him away like that for their goals. Here, the sex makes him feel like he's in control again. But him just being here is a big fuck up on his part. Yeah, he forgot that he's still a commoner. And this is the goddamn princess. And princesses are constantly being watched. So while Griffith is, you know, clapping cheeks, a maid peeps and calls the guards. After the act, Griffith breaks down holding himself because he knows what he did was wrong. But he has no time to spare. He tries to sneak out the princess's room, but he gets caught by the castle's guard. He's detained and visited by the king of Midland, who is not happy about this dude sleeping with his daughter without permission. He starts going off, talking about how he was the only one who believed in them when the whole kingdom thought the Falcons were just common or trash. And the guy has a point. I mean, the king was a real one up until this point. He gave him the promotion of a lifetime for Christ's sake. But as he's going on this rant, Griffith strikes back with a very disturbing comment. He tells the king, you just mad because I got to your daughter when you secretly wanted her all this time. Meaning the king is a sick fuck who has a thing for his own daughter. Something is really wrong with some of these characters, for real. Pissed by Griffith's comment, the king starts going off with the whip. Then he calls him the help of the hunchback of crack cocaine. He tells the human, I guess, to torture Griffith to his heart's content. Then he leaves. Meanwhile, the Falcons are waiting in an open field. They were called here by who they thought was Griffith, but it turns out to be a trap. 
Arrows rain from the sky and take down a shit ton of the Falcons. Even little Ricker gets shot, but he takes it like a champ. The band realizes that they're surrounded, and with no leader, they begin to panic. But Casca takes the helm and leaves the few Falcons she can to safety. So since Guts' departure, Griffith lost his shit and ended up being captured, and now the Falcons are in danger of getting wiped out. Which sucks. But we ain't got time for their problems right now, because we got to talk about what Guts is doing. And for that, we got to do a quick time skip. A year after the Falcons got ambushed, we find our boy watching a combat tournament from the sidelines. He just watched the most recent match with an assassin from a foreign land and a mercenary. Now he wants it on the smoke. He challenges the assassin and beats him no problem. Then the person running the tournament goes to him like, bro, you mad strong. You want to work for me and hunt some bandits in my territory? But Guts is good. Right now, he's focused on his new passion, and that's finding people stronger than him to test his strength. So he was mad about only knowing how to swing his sword, but now he's traveling around the world looking for tough opponents to fight? Yeah, but it's different now because he's fighting to improve himself, not just for survival. Okay, but he's still just swinging his sword around though. I thought my boy was gonna start writing poetry or some shit, I don't know. Anyways, the tournament runner insists that Gus takes him up on his offer. Then he drops the name of the bandits he's after. It's the Band of the Falcon, or what's left of them. This brings us back to the Falcons, who are in a very, very depressing state. Casca has been leading the band this whole time, but they're on their last leg. Good news is they have a basic idea of where Griffith is. Bad news is they have nowhere near the people power to save him. And to make matters worse, they get ambushed again. And this time, the assassin that Guts beat in the tournament is a part of the enemy squad. The Falcons start losing even more people, and a tired Casca is unable to handle the well-rested assassin. He gets the upper hand and puts her in a corner, but in true anime protagonist fashion, Guts shows up at the last minute to put the band on his back again. The Falcon fam sees Guts and they get the morale boost they needed. With him leading the attack, they force the enemies to retreat. Then everyone runs up to him, hyped to see him back. They give him an update on the state of things, and Guts can't help but feel a little guilty because everything went to shit literally a day after he left. However, Guts will have a chance to redeem himself. They tell him about their plan to save Griffith, and from the look on his face, you can tell he's down for the cause. After sharing details about their depressing lives, the Falcons ask Guts what he's been up to. It's been a year and he just now heard about the fall of the Falcons. He had to be doing something. So he tells him about his training. He went to the mountains and trained for a minute, and through that training, he realized that wielding his sword is the one thing that feels natural to him. Afterwards, his boy Judo hits him with the Casca details. Not about how she's doing though, he specifically tells him that in her sleep, she was calling for both Griffith and his name. Hey, so she missed him. Yup, Judo then tells him that right now, she's in a bad spot, but she's not gonna listen to them. The only person that can talk to her right now is Guts. So while everyone is sleeping, Guts waits by a tree, then Casca confronts him and tells him to come with her. They move far from the band, then my girl starts fighting Guts. Damn, I expected a heart to heart, but okay. Well, I guess in this case, they're having a sword to sword. Ah, don't she. Go to your corner, that one hurt. So Guts is dodging Casca's sword swings like they're nothing. And Casca's yelling at him, telling him that this is all his fault. He abandoned Griffith, now they're in this mess. And Guts is like, Casca, it's just me. How the hell did my departure cause such a problem? Obviously, Guts didn't know how important he was to the squad. And obviously, you forgot you're still on timeout. So Casca's yelling at Guts, but it ends when she tells him that Griffith's no good without him. Then he grabs her sword, giving this really depressed look. Then he says, bro, I was just trying to do my own thing. She pulls back after realizing that she was wildin', then she just kind of breaks. She wants to be Griffith's sword, but when Guts showed up, he became the sword. And she caved and be his woman because she knows he has to get with Charlotte to achieve his dreams. Her dream had already ended, and she didn't want to believe it. So overcome with sadness, she lets herself fall off the cliff. But Guts runs up and catches her, then pulls her back up. Then he starts yelling at her because, how are you going to try to kill me, then have me almost die to save your life again? C can I talk now? You done with them stupid ass jokes? Yes. All right, you may speak. So Casca apologizes because she realizes she's always getting him hurt. Then finally, after pages of sexual tension, they kiss. Then they fuck, like a lot. Casca even mentions how she could tell it was his first time. Yeah, I'm like, I don't know how to put this, but the scene felt real. Like the dialogue between Casca and Guts was just really good. Like I felt it in my soul, especially when he loses it because he starts thinking about the whole situation with Donovan and Gambino. Then she comforts him and it's just, Ah, oh, my feels! Right in the feels! So the morning after, Casca asked a big question. Guts, are you gonna say after we rescue Griffith? And it's cute, because now that she's accepted her feelings for Guts, she gets all hype when she asks him. But Guts is like, sorry, bruh, I still gotta leave. Damn, my boy really about to smash and dip. 
No, 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 hold on. You know Guts wouldn't do that to Big Sis. He can't stay because he's finally found his own thing. And that thing is to wield his sword. He's found life in his sword and the sparks created when swords clash. So he wants to dedicate his life to honing his skills and fighting strong opponents. Ha, he sounds like Goku with a sword. No, don't you ever compare Guts to Goku. All right, bro, damn. So at first, Kasuga is like, wow, you really have grown. You're sounding a lot like Griffith. But then she immediately gets mad saying, all you men are trash. It's all about your dreams. What about me? How are you just gonna leave us again? Then Gut stops her and is like, just come with me. And Kasuga gets all shy and shit, but she doesn't give a clear answer. She just calls him stupid and then kisses him. But far, far away, a big ass demon appears out of nowhere. It starts destroying parts of the forest. Now, something beyond human knowledge has begun to stir. And that's where we'll stop for this part. Last time on Berserk, Guts left the Falcons after contemplating it for a minute. He spent a year honing his sword skills and now wants to dedicate his life to testing his skills against strong opponents. And that's great and all, but this leads to Griffith going off the deep end and getting himself captured. So with the Falcon leader in prison, Midland is like, guess we gotta evict the whole bunch, and decide to ambush the band, thus killing more than 75% of their people. Casca takes the reins as leader, but after a year passes, they get ambushed again. Luckily, Guts returns to save their asses though. And after that, Guts and Casca finally stop playing games with each other and they do the damn thing quest for cheeks completed and he was even really on it well now with that out the way guts is ready to direct all of his attention to helping the band save his old friend griffith the day of the rescue quickly arrives the falcons start packing up to sneak into midland after a three-day trip they make it to a cemetery where they enter a secret underground passage once through they rendezvous with someone casca says is on their side it turns out to be princess charlotte she loves her some griffith so much that she's willing to risk her life to try and save him and she dragged her maid friend along too which is wild the group makes their way through the castle grounds and on the way charlotte apologizes for her father's actions towards their leader but judo's like we're not gonna clear the air like this sorry princess don't mean to pry but what the hell did griffith do anyway my man is trying to get right to the point the princess tells him that griffith was in her room but before she has a chance to continue guards show up but just saying that was enough for Casca to assume that Griffith fucked, and this does not sit right with her. Yeah, Casca may love her some guts, but that didn't just throw away her feelings for Griffith. So right now she's feeling mad conflicted. I mean, I don't think she'll be all that conflicted when she sees the thing that he's in, but that's just me. After the princess tricks the guards with their royal powers, they make it to a place named the Tower of Rebirth. This is where Charlotte believes Griffith is being held. Casca thanks the princess for all her help, but this wild boy judo pulls her over and is like, bro. We should so take her as a hostage, just in case. I mean, my man is thinking ahead. Yeah, but taking the princess hostage, bro? That's kind of foul. She can actually die. Yeah, but she voluntarily put herself in the situation. Plus, Guts is here. She'll be fine. Well, it doesn't matter anyway, because she overheard the conversation. And Straight says she doesn't mind being a hostage. See, even she thinks it's a good idea. Now, hold up. Kasuga raises a good point about holding a princess hostage is a high-level crime. How the hell will Griffith rise up in the noble ranks if he's associated with a bunch of princess nappers? I mean, I guess guess when you put it like that, it's probably not a good idea. But Charlotte doesn't care. She starts yelling, saying she doesn't give a fuck if it's a crime. She wants to go. She wants to go save her man. So Casca and the band shut her up and accept the volunteer hostage. Meanwhile, back at the Falcon camp, we find Rickard and the rest of the band chilling at the campfire. Rickard's caught off guard by an elf and runs after it, but after it gets away, he hears what sounds like an enemy raid. But when he makes it back to the camp, he witnesses a horrific scene. A giant demon is eating his fellow Falcons. Jesus, that's gross! Rickard freezes in shock and screams for dear life. The hell are you doing? Run, boy! The demon, who seems to be following the orders of the elf that lured Rickard, closes in on the kid, but the Skull Knight appears and saves his ass at the last minute. Then Rickard collapses in complete despair. They were just talking about how everything was gonna be great when Griffith returns. Now even more Falcons are dead, and he doesn't even understand how it happened. This brings us back to the rescue squad. They made their way deeper into the tower, and Charlie uses this time to tell him the origins of Midland's name. About a thousand years ago, this land was a place where war was an everyday thing. Until one day, a mysterious man named King Gaiseric pulled up to the scene and put an end to all the wars. His past was completely unknown. People didn't even know how he became a king or how he amassed such an army. But after ending the wars, he gave birth to an empire that would last for ages. The king was given nicknames such as the Demon King because of his ruthlessness in battle and his skull-shaped helmet. And yes, if you saw this and was like, oh shit, is that the Skull Knight? You're not alone. I did the same thing, but I'm not cut up to Berserk yet, so I honestly have no idea if these two are connected. Connected or not, the king disappeared when a calamity took out his capital city. The city's name meant land in the middle of nations, which is where the name Midland comes from. But according to the princess, the city that was destroyed a millennia ago is now sleeping at the bottom of this tower. And to make things even more ominous, when Casca drops their source of light, we catch a glimpse of what's at the bottom of the tower. It's a huge pile of corpses, but each one has a brand on their head. They move forward and find the room that Griffith has been hauled in. But when they enter, they're welcomed by the destroyed body of their former leader. 
And when we say destroyed, we mean destroyed. His back is torn up. His tongue has been cut out. The tendons in his arms and legs have been severed. The torture he went through was beyond cruel. Man, his face is so fucked up, they couldn't even show it on the panel. And y'all know what kind of shit they show in this manga. And the worst part is he's still alive. He was alive for all of this. This dude felt everything. I may not like Griffith, but that's a lot. Then after the Griffith reveal, guess who shows up? The hunchback of crack cocaine. He locks the door on them and starts talking that weird shit, saying he and Griffith were like husband and wife as he was torturing him. So Guts snaps and stabs the hunchback through the door. Then my man cuts off his tongue like, nah, bitch, you ain't getting away with that stank ass breath and my boy's tongue. Now I'm taking yours. Then he lets the bastard drop to the bottom of the hole. Good riddance. But when they look up, the band realizes they're surrounded by Midland guards. They tell the Falcons to lay down their weapons or else. Everyone is shook, but Guts has had it. Y'all just messed with this boy Griffith. Now he wants blood. So my man Guts says one thing keep up with me, then tears his way through all the guards while climbing up the steps like a madman. Mind you, these guys have freaking crossbows. And it's not even like they don't use them. They do, but Guts uses an enemy's body to block the arrows. Then he pulls a Sephiroth from his Smash debut and continues fighting with the dude hanging from his sword. And this shit is so clean. Guts is diabolical with it for real. Like, look at this panel right here, son. This is what inspired Madara to slap dog shit out of all those ninja in the Ninja War arc. That's a fact. So Guts single-handedly bodies every guard in their way, including the ones outside the tower. Then before you know it, they're running through the city trying to escape. But now the whole city knows something is amiss. So there are guards everywhere blocking their escape. Soldiers aim their crossbows at the Falcons, but the king stops them. He peeps his daughter and is like, y'all let my wife die, then you're just gonna shoot my daughter? Also, I know a year has passed, but this man definitely aged like a whole decade. Don't get me wrong, the king was old, but not this old, bro. My man is dying. The king piece that they also have Griffith, and this dude snaps and is like, nah, Griffith? You ain't going nowhere. Troops, summon the Baki Raka. And though that sounds like a Yu-Gi-Oh card or a Pokemon, it's not. The Baki Akiraka are a small group of assassins from the east. I believe they come from the same place that other assassin guy came from. Apparently, these guys have killed hundreds of rulers and vassals, and they're more dangerous than an army of 10,000. The king tells them to kill Griffith no matter what it takes, even if it costs him their own lives, but no harm shall come to his daughter. Then with those instructions, they dip. Elsewhere, the Falcons are recuperating from the mess they just had to deal with. Guts is exhausted as fuck, so Costco wipes the blood off to help calm him down. And Griffith watches from afar looking salty as ever. Yeah, stay salty, son. They continue through an underground tunnel, but stop when they find one of the Baki Raka looking like he's about to take a shit on him. Yeah, I just peeped. He really about to shit on him, son. The assassin rushes at him, then does some horror movie crawl backwards after he misses. After that, more assassins show up. The Falcons dodge their attacks, but one shoots a blow dart aimed at Griffith. Charlotte notices them blocks a shot for her man, but the dark causes her to collapse. The assassin tries to run away, but Guts Dead swats him like a fly before he can escape. With the princess hurt, the assassin from earlier reveals himself. He's like, hold up, time out. The princess is poisoned and neither of us can add that. So give us the princess so we can heal her. With no real choice, they let one of the assassins take the princess along with her maid friend. Then the assassins start the smoke again. A new one shows up who can chuck javelins like a freaking cannon. But Judo quickly devises a plan. He uses the sparks from his throwing knives to find the living cannon in the darkness and kill him. Then Pippin strikes the wall to give them more light. This giving Kasuke and Gus a chance to kill the rest of the assassins. But they forgot one, the woman who escorted the princess out of the tunnel. She returns and bombs the narrow space. The Falcons start booking it, but Griffith peeps some light coming in from a part of the tunnel. Pippin feels his energy and breaks the roof. The Infernal that was following them then rises upwards while they escape the tunnel. After her failed assassination attempt, the king executes the remaining assassin. Then he prepares to go after the maid, thinking she's partially responsible. But Charlotte wakes up just in time to tell her father that her maid was only following orders. The king immediately softens up and lets the maid go. Then Charlotte tells her father to let Griffith go as well. He's been through enough. The king looks at her and tells her that she can be at ease. No harm will come to him. But the dude lied. He goes to a soldier and is like, fuck it. Send the black dogs. Now you're probably wondering who the black dogs are. Well, they're only the most savage unit in the army of Midland, made up of some of the place's worst criminals. Think Suicide Squad, but way less likable. According to the king, they would plunder towns and butcher women and children, whether it be in enemy territory or his own. So this man sending the black dogs means he really wants Griffith dead. The leader of this group is this dude named Wild. When he's called in for this job, he gets hype, because apparently he has business to attend to that involves Griffith anyways. Meanwhile, the Falcons pass by a house in the outskirts of the city where they meet some kind people who give them supplies for their escape. They keep it pushing, but when they look back, they find the black dogs chasing them with the corpses of the kind people who helped them. I swear if I did not watch Devil Man Cry Baby, that panel would have really fucked me up. The Falcons realize they won't be able to escape without gaining some more distance, so Guts and Pippin stay back to lay waste to some black dog knights. But then they're stopped by the black dog leader 
leader, who stops Guts' sword swing barehanded. He immediately realizes that this guy can't be human. His presence reminds him of Zod, but before they can continue, Casca calls on them to retreat. She set bombs on the bridge. All Guts and Pippin have to do is cross so she can blow it up. So they both book it, but even after the explosion, the Black Dogs continue their advance. The explosion wasn't useless though. It didn't get a good amount of the Black Dogs, but Wild don't give a shit. When one of his boys tells him the truth, that this is a dumb idea and they should just retreat, he kills a guy and tells him that if they start talking about living and dying, then they'll waste their lives. How are you gonna say that after killing somebody? So I'm sure most of you guys can tell this dude is not human. Well, Guts can tell too. That skirmish verified it for him. Now he's shook, cause that makes him think about the unavoidable death the Skull Knight was talking about. They continue their escape while the Black Dogs run into another one of their traps. Boulders rain from the sky and more of their units die. But once again, this man Wild don't give a fuck. My man says, music to my ears. Advances even more, then punches a boulder with one hand just to show his dominance. All right, Chris Redfield, chill. The Falcons continue pushing forward while the Black Dogs fall for more of their traps. And every time, Wild pushes through like a tank while his comrades die. Then the running finally stops when Corcus and Gaston show up with an army of Falcon members. Guts turns around and looks at Wild like, all right, bro, you on the smoke? Now you got the smoke. And Wild gets hype. Then he confirms that he's a demon when he says that he heard Zod speak about Guts before. Then my man pulls out a log and prepares for the war. Anime 101, guys, the more absurd someone's weapon is, the stronger they are. And this man pulled up with an actual log to a sword fight. You know he's a problem. So after their stare down, Wild and Guts start the battle while their comrades follow through. As usual, the Falcons handle the foot soldiers while Guts 1v1's a leader. Somehow this dude is parrying Guts with a log and our boy is getting tight. So he goes for a swipe to the head, but Wild grabs the sword with his freaking teeth. Then this dude punches Guts' horse. Yo, what did the horse do to you? But Guts pops off his horse, then full on drop kicks Wild, making him fall off his horse. Now these guys are battling on foot, and this guy is still overpowering Guts. But the Falcons are destroying the Black Dogs right now. It gets so bad that one of them acts Wild to retreat. They lost mad people to those traps, and they're losing even more in battle. Why continue when they don't have to? But the Black Dog leader don't give a fuck about his people's problems. He breaks a freaking tree to stop his men from leaving, then he throws his log at the unit who was trying to talk to him. Then he enters full demon form, whose design is really freaking good. Like it's scary as hell, but the Yeti body is kind of cool. So now that he's bigger, our boy replaces his rusty old log with a tree, then he slaps Guts with it. And as strong as Guts is, one does not simply take a hit from a tree, even if you block it. So Guts is out right now. Without a carry, the Falcons are no match for Wild. So he continues to tear through them, no problem. And once again, these panels are killing it with how clean they look. Pretty sure I said this before, but Berserk is some of the best artwork I've seen in manga. Anyways, back to the massacre. The Falcons retreat, but Casca refuses to leave her man who is still knocked out. Wild grabs her while she tries to wake up Guts. Then when she screams for help, Guts pops up like, get your hands off my woman. Then Guts gets his anime power up and starts giving it to the demon. He dodges everything Wild throws at him, then eventually takes him down and everyone just orgasms from how dope Guts looks right now. After the giant falls, Guts rushes over to it for the finishing blow. He strikes the demon's chest, but it retaliates and beats dog shit out of him. Then he gets slumped again. But as Wild gets closer, the will to live surges through him and he slices the thing's eye. Winded, Guts tries to figure out some way to beat the demon. Then an idea comes once he spots a black dog corpse. Wild starts searching for our boy. Then he finds something hiding behind a tree. He hits it with his wild, wild chop, chop, but it was a fake. Then something comes at Wild from above. The demon peeps, punches it, but it's another fake. My man hit him with a double substitution no jutsu. But he ain't a ninja though. Then from behind the last sub, he comes in with his sword raised. But Wild stops the blade with his hand before Guts can deliver a fatal blow. Guts is done with this demon though. He lets out one final battle cry and stabs the demon in the neck with his broken sword. Yo, that Skull Knight was right about him being a struggler. But that's still not enough. Wild attacks him again, so Guts gets him in a sleeper hold and starts stabbing him up some more. Then the demon knocks Guts onto a tree and they both fall. But like the goat he is. Guts gets up while Wild stays down. The Falcons won. After that, the Falcons find a clearing nearby to recuperate from the last battle. They patch up Guts and everyone else who needs it. Then Casca and Judo move away from everyone's talk about Griffith for a sec. He gives her the unfortunate truth and tells him that he's in no condition to fight anymore. His days as a warrior are done. Casca takes the news to the chest, then commands the Falcons to get ready to leave. Meanwhile, back where the Black Dog battle took place, Wild wakes up and kills the soldiers the Falcons left to watch over him. Damn, this dude is 30 as fuck! He 
attacks Guts and Griffith, then grabs Griffith saying, it's him. Then he starts telling Griffith to summon the Great Ones, summon the members of the God Hand, and obviously Griffith has no idea what he's talking about. So the band switches to attack mode and warns Wild to drop their leader. Then Wild laughs at them and strips Griffith of his armor to show them what they're fighting for. Everyone peeps how fucked Griffith's body is and they start to back down. This is the first time they've seen their leader in this condition, so all their dreams of rebuilding the band slowly start to fade. But then right when it looks like Wild might kill the Falcon leader, Zod shows up. He lifts Wild up and stabs him with his horn. The Black Dog leader then starts pleading for his life, telling Zod that Griffith doesn't have the bailet. He's not the man they think he is. But Zod doesn't care. He breaks Wild over his head, thus saving Griffith and the rest of the Falcons. Then he looks at Griffith and tells him that the bailet will come back to him because that's how it is. After that, he flies off. Then if that wasn't enough, something erupts from out of Wild's body and drags him into the ground from the inside. Then once his body fully disappears, they find an old man's body in his place. And this leaves the Falcon shook. But you know what's crazy about all this? As important as that whole Black Dog mini arc seemed, none of that was included in the Golden Age arc movie trilogy. Wild, right? Yeah, when I read this part, I was so confused. The Baki Raka also went in the movie trilogy, which is surprising. The Griffith escape actually seemed pretty easy in the movie, at least compared to how it is here. Yup, but it wasn't. That shit was like playing Dark Souls on go screw yourself mode. Facts, at least a good amount of them made it out alive though. Yeah, but morale within the team is not good. The Falcons are pretty distraught right now because even though they escaped, Griffith is in no condition to lead. Kasuga decides to ponder the thought of officially leading the Falcons, then leaves to go change Griffith's bandages. Meanwhile, Guts and Judo have another one of their bro talks. Judo is talking about starting a thieves group with whoever is down. Guts thinks it's best that he stay, but Judo tells him that he already started his own journey to fulfill his dreams. He has no obligation to stay, but he insists that he bring Kasuga this time. Before they're able to talk more, Gaston shows up with the Falcon Raiders, and they also ask to join the Guts bandwagon. They don't care what they are, they just want to be with Guts, and that shit is mad wholesome. This makes Guts think about the concept of belonging, and he realizes that these guys were his family all this time. Maybe this is where he belongs. After that, he goes to find Casca. When he finds her, she cries in front of him and tells him she can't go with him on a journey anymore. Griffith is too weak. She can't just leave him like this. Guts gets it and tells her that he can stay too. But just like Judo, she tells him he can't stay here when he has his own dreams to fulfill. Meanwhile, while Guts is getting his heart broken, Griffith sees the vision of himself and looks at him like, the fuck are you doing sitting around? Go out there and follow your dreams. This makes him lose it and take control of the carriage to drive it away. Guts pulls away from his convo with Casca when he sees what this wild boy is doing. Then he chases after the man. But before Guts reaches him, Griffith hits a rock then goes flying into a lake. He goes insane, then tries to off himself, but he's too weak to. Then while he cries about the situation, he finds a crimson bailet, the egg of the king. The Falcons move forward to help Griffith, but when they find him, they spot something crazy. A solar eclipse has started, but this shit ain't natural. Demons pop up behind Griffith, so Guts runs over to try and save him. But the moment he touches him, everyone in the area gets transported to this dark place, straight out of your worst nightmare. Yeah, the floor and ceiling of this place are made up of faces in pure agony. This man Miura knew what he was doing. Some of the Falcons start freaking out over what just happened, but Casca's like, get it together. Do y'all wanna freak out and die or get organized and find a way out? And Guts is once again taken aback by how she can control the situation when things are this crazy. The Falcons follow Casca's guidance and try to organize themselves, but as they do, the members of the God Hand show up. These demonic titans point at Griffith and announce that he's the chosen one. The God Hand has chosen him to join their ranks. Guts pulls out his knife and starts blacking on him, saying, No, 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 fuck that. My boy ain't joining shit. The God Hand member named Slan then looks at him and says, Oh, look at them. They all cute with their friendship and shit. All of you will make for a great sacrifice to turn Griffith into one of us. Then they explain that because Griffith got that bailet, he has the qualities of a demon. But this bailet is a special bailet. It's the Crimson Bailet. So he will be reborn into a demon as powerful as them. Then, the time for talking ends. The demons say that it's time to bring the boy to the altar. Then a giant arm shoots up carrying Griffith, but leaves Guts hanging. Once at the altar, the God Hand tells Griffith that his dreams require sacrifice. He's already built a stack of corpses for his goals, but if he really wants to get to the castle that he's always dreamed of, he's going to have to sacrifice even more people. If he still wants to rule his own kingdom, all he has to do is say, I sacrifice within his heart. Now, no matter how many times we see this part, it always looks like things may turn out good. I mean, Griffith just got saved by his friends. His ambitions are important, yeah, but there's gotta be a way to rule a kingdom without sacrificing all of your friends, right? Nah, Griffith don't work like that. He wants his dream and he wants it now. So he looks back at Guts while thinking about how this is the first man who made him forget about his dream. 
Then he accepts the God Hand's offer and all hell breaks loose. All the Falcons get marked with the same weird looking brands all those dead people had in the bottom of the Tower of Rebirth. Then the demons arise to begin feasting on the poor soldiers. Meanwhile, away from this mayhem, we find Ricker looking around for the rest of the Falcons. When he gets to where they all were before they got sent to the Shadow Realm, he peeps a huge tornado with the Skull Knight and Zod fighting within it. He reads reveal that the Skull Knight has been fighting demons for years, and he happens to be Zod's old rival. But back in the Shadow Realm, more Falcons die. It gets to the point where only Koska and Guts are left. Guts finally gets thrown off the hand after beating the shit out of some demons. But he looks around him and notices that everyone is dead. Our boy screams in anguish, then pauses is when he finds Casca in the hands of a demon. He enters his own again and starts tearing through the demons to get to her, but they overpower him and hold him down. Then Griffith awakens from his transformation as Femto, the Birdman. Guts looks at his old friend, barely conscious, then is forced to watch as he violates Casca in front of him. Guts does everything to save her. He rips off his arm, even gets one of his eyes gouged, but he's too late. The deed has been done, and now Guts is broken. And fam, there were a lot of events that happened in this final part that hurt, but this one? Bro, even after watching the movie and knowing what was gonna happen, I still had to will myself to read this part. Griffith really just said, fuck my friends. Then he transforms, gets bird wings, and pulls some shit like this? Like, how can you feel good about yourself after pulling some shiesty shit like that, for real? So Casca is knocked out, Guts is pretty much done, and all hope seems completely lost. But out of nowhere, the Skull Knight shows up and rescues both Guts and Casca. And surprisingly, Femto hesitates before trying to kill them when they leave. Outside of the Shadow Realm, the Skull Knight appears before Ricker with Casca and Guts in hand. Zod shows up hella shocked by the fact that Guts is still alive. And because of this crazy luck, he and the Skull Knight decide to put their grudge match on hold. The Knight informs Ricker that all the other Falcon members are dead. Then he takes them and leaves the place before more demons show up. Guts wakes up four days later. Ricker tries to talk to him, but the first person he demands to see is Casca. They point him to her, but she freaks out when he touches her. It seems that the Griffith situation not only took her memories away, but reverted her behavior to that of a child. So now she's afraid of Guts. I mean, the dude is scary looking, missing an arm and missing an eye. I can see where the fear is coming from, but this still hurts Guts hard, so he leaves. He rushes through the forest feeling a cluster of emotions as he remembers everything that went down. Then he stops in the middle of a field, but the brand that he got from the Eclipse event starts irritating him. The Skull Knight appears and is basically like, what did I say, bro? I told you your life would be fucked. Now you gotta live in hard mode forever. Take the sword to see what I mean. When Guts catches the Knight's sword, he's swarmed by a bunch of ghosts. He begins to fight the ghosts, while the Skull Knight explains that the brand now attracts the beings of darkness. From now on, this is his life. He must live between the world of the living and the world of the dead. And Guts hears the dude, but he's like, yo, fuck that. Basically what you're saying is all these monsters want the war and I'm here for it. I'll kill them all, every single one. They should have never left your boy alive because now I'm coming for all the asses, especially Griffiths. And the Skull Knight fucks with the energy, but the ghouls stop attacking. The Knight tells Guts that they found another target and Guts knows it's Casca. He asks the Knight to borrow his horse, but instead he grabs Guts and they ride back to Casca together. They find her standing on a hill with a bunch of ghosts warming around her. Guts grabs her and asks if she's okay, but then she gives birth to a demon thing. That's freaking disgusting, bro. Guts is like, ew, kill it, while trying to step on it. But Casca stops him. The Skull Knight then tells him that she was with child. But when Femto did what he did, the fetus was cursed. So Guts tries to kill it again, but it disappears. The Skull Knight states that it moved to a place closer to the world of the dead, but someday it will come back. Then the Knight leaves them, telling Guts that they will meet again if he continues the fight against Inhumans. Some time passes after this event. Then one day, Gus decides to head off. He puts on his legendary black armor, and Rickard equips him with an artificial arm. Then the blacksmith in the cottage there hands him a sword to use in his journey. Which, if you ask me, looks kind of trash. Like, who are you really gonna kill with that, son? You see what they were just up against? But before our boy gets a chance to leave, his brand starts bleeding. A demon is out here lurking. The thing busts into the cottage and challenges Guts. So Guts starts going off, and he actually starts bodying the thing. But then his sword breaks. Damn, son. The demon then starts slapping Guts around, but then Rickard tells him to use the arm. Guts activates it, then his arm blasts the demon right through the head. Turns out this arm is also a mega buster. Dope. But the blast wasn't enough to kill the thing. As it recuperates, Guts looks around and finds something interesting. Next thing you know, the beast goes flying through the cottage. Then Guts cuts the thing in half with a new giant sword. The blacksmith then stands in awe as Guts easily holds the sword he thought was useless. A giant slab of iron meant to kill dragons, the Dragon Slayer. And Guts is like, holy shit, this, this is what I needed. After all that, Guts prepares for his departure. Rickard tries to stop him and doesn't that it's best that he just stay here. The Falcons are dead. There's no use getting revenge for dead people. But Guts looks at a kid and says, nah, bro, it ain't over. The Falcons are still alive. 
We are still here. This war ain't over yet. So protect Costco while I do what I do best and destroy our enemies. Then with this more rage pushing him forward, he starts his quest to avenge his friends. And that is how Guts went from a baby found in the middle of death to a survivor ready to take on hordes of demons. That's it y'all, we finished. That is the whole Golden Age arc explained. All five parts, it's all done. We did it, it's finally done. Now it's time for the moment you've all been waiting for, conscience. Thoughts. Yup, Berserk is trash. Nah, 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 I kid, I kid. After seeing this whole story unfold, I can see why Berserk is seen as a masterpiece. The world these guys live in is deep, gruesome and dark. And Miura shows that naturally through plot without throwing a shit ton of information at you. The characters are extremely well written, even the side characters and the action panels be fuego. And the development of Guts, bro. Best character development I've seen in a protagonist, period. Like I said plenty of times, at first glance, you think Guts is just some dude with a rage boner, but he's actually more human than most characters I've seen in anime and manga out there. And this is just the beginning of his story. So much more shit happens that I don't even know about because I haven't caught up yet. But even if we don't, we think you should because Berserk is that heat. It gets the Donchi Ultra stamp of approval. And that brings an end to the Golden Age arc of Berserk. Thank you guys so much for watching this far and huge shout out to Kentaro Miyora for making this all possible by creating Berserk. May his soul rest in peace. Shout out to all my incredible patrons. I appreciate you guys so much for all the support you give each month. And if you are not already a patron, go to my Patreon link in the description below to find out how you can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. And by supporting you get dope perks like watching videos like this early, watching the uncensored webtoon reactions and plenty more. And one more thing before you guys go, I've actually created my first newsletter meant to help out content creators who are just confused about this path that we're on. Whether you're new to the game or a veteran just looking for guidance, this newsletter is made for you. So check the link in my description or I'll probably put like a link somewhere on the screen so you can click it there and join, it's completely free. But with that being said, be easy, stay lit, stay healthy out there, black lives matter and don't forget, you can do whatever the hell you put your mind to. All it takes is practice and time. Peace out, y'all.